We now return to the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. Back in the room. Police are still busily investigating in here, then. But Gina's nowhere to be seen. Where is she? Yes, it has been blissfully quiet, hasn't it? Perhaps she's out investigating on her own, practicing what her boss taught her. Well, I expect she'll be back before too long. Should we wait? Actually... There's something different about this room. Since the last time we were here, isn't there? I just noticed the stool. It always used the time to investigate more thoroughly. Really, broken stool is not a not a thing. Okay, well, this little trunk wasn't here before, was it? Oh, it appears to be made of metal. Must be very heavy. I wonder to whom it belongs. There are some initials on the outside. Look, P G. Let's ask one of the policemen if they know how it came to be here. Boy, what do you think you're doing? Oh, it's her, sorry. That's my trunk, it is. Hands off. Gina. Where were you hiding? I don't know. You leave something unattended for a few seconds, and every Tom, Dick, and Harry's got his green eyes on it. Ah, uh, that's just a wild guess, Gina, but... What? Well, spit it out, Odo. Is it fair to say that you've only owned that trunk since this morning's trial? What? What are you trying to say? Come on, this trunk goes with me everywhere. Always has. Where have you been the last year? I mean, it's got Tobias Gregson's initials on it, but... I'm trying not to incur your wrath, mainly. What do you mean this year? Been here eight months, right? Converse! You should hear them talking at the yard now. They should be ashamed of themselves. They're saying it was the boss who killed all them bludgers. Uh, you mean the whole Reaper thing? Yeah. Apparently the boss was investigating stuff that no one else at the yard knew nothing about. Stuff to do with all them criminals what got off scot free. Yes, the ones prosecuted by Lord Van Zeeks who used bribery and corruption to evade conviction. Well, then, obviously, it was that bloomin' reaper giving the orders, wasn't it? But why would people be suspecting Inspector Gregson of being involved in the killings? There was a notebook hidden in his office. Oh, no. This doesn't sound good. It had details about all the crimes that have been pegged as the reaper's work. What? No. Oh, did you see it, Gina? Did you see that notebook? They wouldn't play me, let me. Because I'm just an apprentice, apparently. But it was me who found it, and he was my boss. That's right. I was pretty miffed about it, so I nicked it. <laughs> oh. I sneaked a peek at what it said anyway. Oh, that's our Gina. So, you managed to see what was written in Gregson's secret notebook anyway, did you? Why, I see it. It's my right to read what he wrote. And what had he written, Gina? Dates, times, places, names, and a oh, long list of them. All details about the bludgers supposed to have been done in by the Reaper. But there could be an explanation for that. Perhaps it was a record of the inspector's investigations into the Reaper's activities. Exactly. That's what I said. That's the first thing you'd think, right? As it happens, it was full of names I recognized anyway. While the Reaper's targets were almost exclusively known leaders of London's criminal underworld. Well, yeah, but there was one name right at the end that was a bit odd. At the end of the list, you mean? I'm pretty sure the date against it was 31st of October. Oh, the day before the inspector was found dead. So, what was the odd name? It wasn't like a name I've ever seen before. It was something like, um... Nah, it's no good. Can't remember. 
I don't think it was an English name. Put it that way. Was it Karoma? Oh dear, what a pity. There was something else too. Well, I don't know if it matters, but the same name kept coming up over and over. Shin, it was. I don't suppose it means anything, but... Did you say Shin? Eh? What? It does mean something? Lord Van Zeeks knew the name too. He mentioned her as well. The woman who actually did the deeds. And now we find out her name appeared in Gregson's secret notebook. You haven't, we haven't seen you for a while, have we, Gina? No, of course not. I've been busy, ain't I? Investigating and all that. And all that. The lads at the yard are trying to trace the boss's movements the day before it happened. The day before... That would be the undercover... That would be the undercover investigation into the Red-Headed League, then. Only the boss didn't go, did he? He found some cove what he was pretending to be him, didn't you, though? Didn't... didn't... didn't I? You found him. Um, hmm. Yes, I did. Yes, it was Mr. Vigil who actually went to the park on Lime Street that day, posing as Gregson. Well, anyway, you ain't the only one turning stuff up. I've got my own ways of getting results. And me and me partner here get together. When we and me partner here get together, there's nothing we can't track down. Oh, little Toby, he's such a faithful friend. So have you tracked anything down then? What do you think, eh? Of course we have. What you tell though, police business, innit? Uh can't tell you. Jesus Christ, I'm dyslexic. Anyway, point is, if you don't ever need help. You know where to tune to, right? Me and the L hound here. Right. Because he looks oh so hellish, honest. Honest. Hellhound, talk about it. Um, Gina, about your hellhound there. Chief Inspector Toby, you mean? He's the pride of the force, he is. Japanese police dog means something quite different, and not altogether nice to those involved in crime. But here in Britain, it's a wonderful compliment, it seems. For a canine, at least. It should be. After all, in the Great Exhibition case the other day, it was Toby here who managed to locate Drebber's workshop. Maybe it's time for another demonstration of what this super dog can do, eh? Do we have something the Chief Inspector could catch the scent of, I wonder? Um, the hairpiece that was on his head? Take that! Well, Chief Inspector Toby, if you wouldn't mind having a sniff of this. He might be a little too keen, don't you think? Chief Inspector made short work of Gina there. Ah, look what he's gone to. Oh my, that trunk clearly still has a very strong scent of Inspector Gregson. In other words, it must have belonged to him. Oh, all right. It's a fair cop, I suppose. And you nearly got away with it, too. If it hadn't been for that meddling dog and those damn kids. You always talk so proudly of Chief Inspector Toby's nose and what it can achieve. Did it not cross your mind that he might identify something that was right next to us? Yeah, that was a bit of a bloomer, weren't it? It's enough now, then, Gina. Hey, I think it's time you told us the truth about that trunk. It, it won't like that. It, it, it just won't. What are you talking about? I know what's going through your, that head of yours, but that ain't what happened. All right, then. What did happen? Well, like I said before, we were trying to trace the boss's movement. So I let Toby here have a whiff of the boss's overcoat. And as soon as I'd done that, he went off like a shot. 
straight to the sandwich. That sandwich. Straight to a sandwich. Not to a bag of chips. Mr. Naruhodo, I believe Gina means the witness. Let's see. The capital letter gave it away that it was the name and not the sandwich, but in Japanese that would have been written in katakana and there would be no capitalization. So you wouldn't have known what they were talking about. Oh, I forgot about that sandwich. Yeah, he had it hidden between them bolt wooden bolts of his. The boss is drunk. You mean when they heard the sound like a gunshot and all piled in here? Exactly. He nabbed it from the scene. Goodness. Are we gonna charge him? Me and the chief inspector gave that sandwich a good grilling, and you know what he said? Shit. What is your voice? I thought it might fetch a good price, and the chap wouldn't be needing it anymore, so... Uh, but, but that's all I did. No, nothing more, nothing less. <sighs> Would you add me, Adam and Eve the cheek of it, eh? Stealing their dead boss's stuff to flog. So Miss Venus wasn't the only one to meddle with the scene of the crime, then. How could they? So anyway, that's how it happened. And it's a pretty decent trunk, so I figured I might as well make use of it. Is there something wrong with that, eh? Well, then maybe you and Mr. Sandwich should try to find the answer to that question together. Maybe you should open it. I think perhaps that trunk should be turned over to the police, don't you? What are you on about? I am the police. I am the law. Uh, Gina, if you wouldn't mind... Could we maybe examine it? Yeah, all right then. Do what you want with it. Thank you. We shall make a detailed record of our examination of the evidence. Gregson's trunk has been entered into the court record. I suppose we could do that immediately. What's the matter with Toby? Why is he acting so aggressively toward me all of a sudden? Before we do this... Let me look at this damn trunk. Okay, well, I already see the scratch. Well, let's have a look inside. Look, there's something inside. Oh, let's see. It appears to be a passport, authorizing him to travel overseas. Was Inspector Gregson about to go on a trip abroad then? He said as much. Perhaps the date of departure might tell us something. That was... Oh. What is it? It was travel for the 31st of October, just one day before the incident. What? Really? Passport has been entered in the court record. Gregson went to France the day before his body was discovered. You'd think that'd be so, but... And you're gonna tell me that this scratch has nothing to do with it. Have you seen this huge gash across the side of the trunk here? It's gone right through the leather and into the metal behind. Gosh, for a metal chest like this to have been so badly damaged, whatever made the gash must have struck the side of the trunk with considerable force. I wonder how it happened. Perhaps... From a katana? I mean, we have a chip of blade right here, so... You see that? There's something stuck on the side of the trunk there. It's glinting. Or an axe. There is an axe-wielding guy that we know. It looks like a fragment of metal of some sort, but it's wedged in so tightly I can't remove it. Oh, well, don't cut yourself. You'd better leave it, I think. It kind of looks like the tip, though. Oh, Jesus. There's all sorts of stuff here. Look at this dark stain here. Do you think? Yes, I'm afraid so. I think it's blood. Uh, I knew you were going to say that. So that presumably means that this was present at the scene when Inspector Gregson was killed. It's the most logical conclusion, yes. I think Gina's been carrying this around with her. If you didn't know any better, I suppose it does look like a grease stain from all the fish and chips.
Nothing else. Okay. I mean, that, that definitely looks like the tip of the sword. And it was kind of implied earlier, too, wasn't it? That, uh... Like, when, when he was holding up the sword, it was... Arahoto was like, I, I wish I'd had a chance to draw it before. So now we're going to have to ask him to draw the sword to see if the tip is still there. Interesting. Anyway, now that we've taken this little time pocket, let's get back to the story. Mr. Narahoto, be careful. It must be the trunk. Toby, oh, I, what are you doing? You're gonna lick his face off. Mr. Narahoto! Mr. Narahoto! Gina, quickly, hail a carriage. Oh, Mr. Narahoto, are you all right? Miss Susato? Ah, conscious again at last. A blessed relief, my dear fellow. After all, to drop dead after a moderate licking like by a small terrier, most unseemly. What is or isn't seemly is irrelevant here, Mr. Sholmes. I'm so glad there's no lasting damage. How are you feeling? I'm fine, thank you. Did you bring me back here? Ah, what's this on my head? A, a bandage? Sadly, we now had no ice, so that's a compress of sugar water. Sugar water. Don't worry, Mr. Narahoto, it's a first aid treatment that my father taught me. Oh, uh, thank you. So, let us take tea when you're feeling up to it. But of course, no sugar in the patient's cup. Ah, the bump on my head is throbbing sweetly enough, don't worry. Whenever you feel ready, then. Okay. Before we do this... We're gonna go back. We're gonna go back, because apparently there's a, an achievement tied to doing so. Sorry. Why are we really sorry? It's daft, isn't it? If you asked me a year ago, the cops could go hang for a long cat. But we've got to have police, ain't we? Catch the bludgers. So us divers can go about our business in peace. Uh, wait, sorry? I don't think I can have heard that properly. He said he was going to teach me everything he, I needed to know to be a detective. But all he got around to showing me was where the best flaming fish and chips are. Chips and shoppers are. Actually, that reminds me. Gregson said he was supposed to be going to Paris in the near future, didn't he? Is something wrong? Oh, no, I'm sure I'm reading too much into things. It's just that the timing seems very coincidental. Huh? You know, the boss was acting a bit strange recently. Not like he was always in a rush. That's it? That's it? Okay, well, anyway. There's apparently an achievement to doing that, to talking to her after the incident. So, back we go to, uh... Back to here. I guess we can converse with her? Sure. 
Are you all right, Mr. Natahono? It's rather unusual to find ourselves here in the middle of our investigations. It's... it's just occurred to me that I might have forgotten something when we left this morning. Please don't worry, as long as you continue to investigate thoroughly, you won't go far wrong. Oh, uh, yes, of course. I, I must get back to work as soon as possible. Okay, that's not what we're looking for. Um, thank you for your concern, Mr. Sholmes. My dear fellow, think nothing of it. I must say, I was quite startled when I heard that you'd been attacked by a dog. For a moment, I feared the infamous murderer of so many had come back from the dead. You mean the professor? Fortunately, I see your prized throat is unscathed. That stiff, turned up collar of yours obviously afforded some welcome protection. Was I that close to death? All I really remember is the dog licking my face over and over and over again. Well, if you wish to avoid such troubles in the future, a little mustard spread on the cheek should do the trick. I should think that it would balance the sweetness of your bandage rather splendidly. What the hell are you talking about? What on earth is going on in here? Am I having a bad dream? Ah, oh, no. It's an old German folk song. Rather a fine rendition, I think. That's the least of my concerns. Um, Iris. Iris, what's the matter? Um, who is that sprawling, I mean, that relaxed gentleman over there? Iris? Uh, has she been listening? Excuse me, sir. I do apologize for troubling you whilst you're singing so merrily, but would you be kind enough to explain the situation? Well, that worked. Crooning gentleman and a mute young girl. Rather tantalizing juxtaposition. And one that appears to have incited the gods of deduction within me to find their voices too. Ah, Mr. Sholmes, do you mean... Why are we doing a deduction here? Is this a crime scene? The strains of reasoning within me are playing now as a delightful duet. One melody sings of a reunion full of nostalgia. That's the other. It's a morose theme about the great secret you're trying so desperately to conceal, Iris. It turned as white as a sheet. No, that's just the weather in Britain. So, as usual, you've instantly seen to the very heart of the matter. And by the time my own brief performance is over, I feel sure this gentleman's song will reach its finale. So then, to Musicland, where all the sweetness, where all is at sweetness and delicacy and harmony. Pray do enjoy Herlock Sholmes' latest Logic and Reasoning Spectacular. Firstly, we consider the gentleman's nationality. Clearly, he's a German with no grasp of the English language. This evidenced by the Germanic song he sings and his apparent inability to understand when asked to desist. So, why is the man here at all, and in such apparently high spirits? The answer, of course, Iris, is clearly known to you. Indeed, we need only follow the gaze of those bright young eyes to unravel that particular part of this mystery. The reason for the man's mildly irritating wobbling is revealed by the opal tea. tea. 
You obviously offered our German guest a cup of your latest herbal blend. Tea's delectable flavor has made the man's spirit soar, and resulted in this joyful ditty tumbling incessantly from his lips. I eagerly await sampling the flavor myself, that I may join the fellow in his state of elation. But now to the next question. Who exactly is this gentleman availing himself so thoroughly of the city? As it happens, a number of years ago now, a certain gentleman of German origin engaged my services in solving a particularly delicate case. It required the retrieval of letters once sent to an acquaintance that might be proved might have proved problematic. In order to conceal his noble identity, he also arrived at my office in a mask. The gentleman's name was Wilhelm Gottsreich Sigismund von Ormstein. Where have we heard this name before? That's a little guy, though. That's that kid. The King of Germany. If my memory serves, the mask worn by this gentleman is identical. Yes, there can be no question that mask belongs to the King of Germany. It would appear that His Majesty remembers the fine service I afforded him, and has decided to show his face again, mask and all, in order to express his gratitude. A well-mannered monarch indeed, wouldn't you agree, my dear fellow? So, the identity of this masked visitor is in fact my former client, the King of Germany. Indeed, his son is currently in London as well, enjoying the wonders of the Great Exhibition. That was only the first part? Which leaves us with one remaining imponderable. Yes, you, young Iris. Your apparently inexplicable silence is unable to hide the truth. Yes, the reason for your muteness is concealed inside that knapsack. A five-pound note, I believe. I must say, as your compatriot, I'm deeply saddened. It would appear that you've allowed yourself to be bribed into silence by His Royal Highness, earning yourself some spending money in exchange for keeping quiet about the King's secret. And now, the final piece of the puzzle. What is this secret you strive to hide with your silence, Iris? Ah, yes. We need only follow the brief involuntary twitch of your eyes to find the answer. You were attempting to abscond with the coffee cup. My favorite coffee cup, in fact. Or should I say, the handle of my favorite coffee cup. Coffee cup. It appears that his high-spirited highness broke it in the midst of his hijinks. Which leads us to the sad truth. My favorite coffee cup has been broken by the King of Germany, and Iris, you tried to conceal it from me. I shall have to a bill sent via governmental channels to the German royal family for its replacement. This concludes Hillock Sholmes' great deduction of this painful puzzle. With your silence as well, the fellow's jovial warbling rather rings in the ears, does it not? Um, Mr. Sholmes, I must say something does rather trouble me. Pray, Mrs. Hutter, do tell. His Royal Highness doesn't appear to have moved a muscle since we arrived. Ah, and you haven't said a word either, Iris. If Mr. Sholmes has it all right, you might as well own up to it now. Your reasoning isn't entirely without substance, I must admit. And one other thing, Mr. Sholmes. 
get another grievance, Mr. Naruhodo? Surely not. Well, I actually read the story of that case recently, the one you were just describing. And according to that, at least, it wasn't the king of Germany, it was the king of Bohemia. Goodness, was it? Yes, that's quite true. Master Gotts, the prince, testified to that in court. In his words, I have come to see... I have come to see the German. <laughs> in his words, I have come to see the great exhibition all the way from my home in Bohemia. I would ask you to keep that minor error to yourselves. It could easily become quite a scandal. I believe, Mr. Narahodo, that it's our turn now to make some corrections to a number of minor errors that may have slipped in. Yes, even Mr. Sholmes is willing to admit he might be slightly wide of the mark this time. Though it's clear that Iris is definitely hiding something. We need to find out the truth behind this mysterious scene. But one truth is incontrovertible. My favorite coffee cup is no more. So, shall we embark again? A joint presentation of Herlock Sholmes' logic and reasoning spectacular. So what? It's some mix of herb <laughs> herbs that gives you the urge to sing? Goodness, I should like to try some. And I'd like to hear your singing, but this man... Just... how long does he intend to keep up with that tune, do you suppose? As I said, he's been stock still the entire time, and if you look closely, his lips aren't moving either. Uh -huh. So I'm not sure what's actually responsible for the spirited singing, but I suspect the answer lies at the end of Iris's gaze. Imagine it's the gramophone. Take that! The reason for the man's mildly irritating warbling is revealed by the gramophone. Indeed, no well bred gentleman would break into an obscure folk song when making a social call. In other words, this gentleman isn't singing at all, in fact. It would appear that the fellow is unconscious. Ah, the music seems to have stopped now. I ask you, Mr. Narahodo. Yes? Why would I have purchased a recording of that gibberish? How should I know? Well, never mind. One with the deduction. Who, exactly, is this gentleman availing himself so thoroughly of the setting? Okay... My first inclination was to suggest that it was going to be the Kotaba, but... That profile looks like the model for Gregson. So it's either Gregson in disguise. Or it's Makotaba. Although we've already established that it was actually the King of Bohemia, it seems Mr. Scholz intends to persist with his Germany theory for some reason. Come to think of it, the young prince was wearing a mask as well, wasn't he? Mr. Gotts? The boy whom you had in tears? Don't remind me. Or anyone else. Do you suppose all members of the aristocracy of mainland Europe wear masks? I'm sure they do. Well, probably, anyway. But the point is, that mask doesn't belong to any king. 
No, that's right, as we well know, because we can identify the true owner of this mask. Yes, there could be no question, that mask belongs to Kazuma Asogi. In other words, my memory is sublimely unreliable. Only you could try to make that sound positive. Kazuma's mask has been languishing on his metal on this metal chest for several days. Though that doesn't explain why the gentleman is wearing it now. But it is now a simple matter to determine our guest's true identity. After all, the gentleman is unconscious. We need only excuse ourselves in advance, gently lift the mask and peer beneath it. I, I don't believe it. Ah, f f f f f f f f f f father? Yeah, imagine. I'm afraid, Mrs. Otto, you must be mistaken. No, I think not, Mr. Sholmes. And it would appear our logic and reasoning has once again revealed the truth. This mysterious visitor... ...is my unconscious father, Eugene Mikotoba. Logic and reasoning, we're just looking and saying. This is seriously like Moonlight Mask here. <laughs> like he's wearing wearing the same clothing and he's got the mustache that only a few characters have had and you know. Who is this mysterious fellow? It's Pikachu, which leaves us with one remaining imponderable. Why is Iris being silent? Because she broke the cup. So that's a five pound note poking out from Iris's knapsack, is it? Oh dear, I can't be sure. Most money that we encounter is in coin form. I know. I'm not even sure if we've seen any bank notes here in Britain at all, have we? Uh, but anyway, Father would never have paid money for Iris's silence. He certainly seems like the silent type himself, though, judging by his present state. There must be some other reason for Iris's silent I silence, I suppose. Perhaps what Iris is trying so hard not to give away with her eyes is something entirely different. We can't spin up and back, so... This metal chest? It contains important documents, doesn't it? And it's been opened. Yes, details of all the cases Mr. Sholmes has worked on over the years. Written up by Iris's father, if I'm re remembering it correctly. Iris insists that the chest is kept locked at all times. She's never once shown me inside. Well, its contents are invaluable to her, I suppose, and entirely irreplaceable. But look at it now. The catch is unlocked for once. Ah, uh, so it is. That's hard to ignore. Very. I've never seen that chest unlocked before in all the time we've been staying here at Baker Street. Well, okay, that's probably it then, huh? Take that! Yes, the reason for your muteness is concealed inside that metal chest. An excellent observation. For upon closer inspection, there is something different about the chest's appearance. It's kept locked at all times, yet now the catch is open. Evidently, this has something to do with your refusal to speak, Iris. But it's a simple enough matter to incite you to speak, I'm sure. I merely... I merely need open this chest. Did they... did... Uh, see, that was clearly Sean saying that, but the name said Ryunosuke. Here we go. No, hell he don't!
Mr. Sholmes? Lily! He's dead. Never. Oh, Harry, I told you not to open it. Ah, uh, so you found your voice now, Iris. In other words, what just happened clearly reveals the truth here. Yes, the real reason for your silence until now is... And this is somewhat different to the usual dance of deduction you perform with Mr. Sholmes, isn't it? Well, he's left me alone on the ballroom floor, so I'm going to have to dance this part, this next part solo. Anyway, I need to get to the bottom of this for my own peace of mind. Now then, Iris isn't usually the silent type, so... You mean you don't actually know the answer yet? Despite that knowing point of... Despite that knowing point of the finger before? Miss Susato. Sometimes a man needs to point his finger first and think later. Oh, well, if you say so. I think we'd better examine Iris more closely and try to rescue the situation, then. Well, it's gotta be that piece of paper, then, yeah? The key! That's a key she's holding. Look! I'm sure that wasn't in her hands before, was it? No, you're quite right. It appeared as if by magic. That's strange. Big old iron key. Where did it materialize from? Well. Take that! Yes, the real reason for your silence until now is that key behind your back. When Mr. Sholmes was thrown into the air before, Before you called out to try to stop him, you slipped something out of your mouth. That something is the key now in your hands. No doubt the key to the chest. And so... You're so clever, Runo. So now it becomes clear. Thanks to Mr. Sholmes' graphic demonstration, we can well imagine what happened here. But... but... Professor Mikotoba also opened the metal chest only to be punched into the air land sprawled on the city. Wait, that doesn't explain all the facts. What about the stylish scarf, and the cup of tea, and above all, why would he be wearing Kazuma-sama's mask? Well, for those curious details, I can think of only one explanation. Clearly, an unbelievable miracle took place in this room. Isn't that right, Iris? Considering how the room was arranged before this whole painful experience took place, when Professor Mikotoba opened the chest, completely unaware of what awaited him inside, the mask was flung into the air just as he was, only to land neatly on his face when it fell back down. And the teacup's journey through the air ended when it caught on the unconscious professor's finger. Y you mean to say that the stylish scarf is actually just a tablecloth? This is the great detective's office, after all, a place of miraculous deductions. Would you expect anything less? Yes, you're right. It happened exactly as you said. Which makes me think it didn't. Brilliant, Runo. This concludes Dionosuke Narahoro's great deduction of this punchy puzzle. So then, why don't I make a fresh pot of tea for us all? Objection! An admirable performance, Mr. Narahoro. But in the final act of the show there, you rather missed everything of importance. And Mr. Sholmes? If you would cast your mind back to my earlier deduction. Iris, clearly you are hiding a great secret. She is? From the look on her face. Mr. Sholmes must be right. Whatever that great secret is, the cat isn't out of the bag yet. So I put it to you again. 
You were attempting to abscond with that coffee cup. It really is a shame about Mr. Sholmes' cup. It must have been smashed when Professor Mikotoba opened the chest. Oh dear, so many things seem to have been broken here. But now that the deduction has taken a different direction, Iris doesn't seem to be trying to hide the broken cup anymore. In other words, her great secret is something else. Let's put our observational skills to work here one final time, then. <sighs> Mr. Sholmes' favorite cup. Or what's left of it. Just the handle. It was obviously hurled into the air along with the Professor Mikotoba. If only it had been this cup that had caught on his finger before it hit the floor. Yes, but anyway, whatever Iris is trying to hide, it's certainly not this handle. Ooh. Ah, look. There... there seems to be some more papers here. Is Iris trying to hide them underneath the tray? The insignia, Mr. Notohoto. It's an official Scotland Yard document. What? But why would Iris have... We must ask her. An official Scotland Yard document. Take that! You were attempting to abscond with that case file. Iris, as you know very well, nothing escapes the attention of a great detective. Oh no! We visited Scotland Yard's autopsy laboratory earlier today, and Dr. Gorey informed us the autopsy report of Clint Van Zeeks had gone missing. Clint Van Zeeks, mm, yes, I do seem to recall that some years ago I asked to see the report in question. You were with me, weren't you, Iris? You mean, it was you, Iris? So those papers you have there are... Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. So wait a minute, she's like, what, 11? 10? A few years ago, she would have been 8? Truth. I would like to have thought I could have predicted the booby trap chest. But it caught me completely off guard. I was very nearly the late consulting detective, Herlock Sholmes. I'm sorry, Harley. So you mean this autopsy report really is... Yes, I took it from the lab. Even though I knew it was very important. Is there something in it that troubled you, Iris? Not exactly something that troubled me. Something I'd been looking for when I saw this report, uh, when I saw the writing in it. I knew it was Daddy's. The, the writing? Your father's writing? What do you really mean? Iris, must be something that's hard for her to talk about. Forgive me for interrupting, my dear fellows. Uh, Mr. Sholmes, what is it? I feel as though the poor, unconscious gentleman on the city has been somewhat forgotten. Ah, uh, father! Perhaps we should find our guest somewhere more peaceful to rest. Mr. Nadahoro, yes. Would you be so kind as to lend him your bed? We must do our very best to make him comfortable, I feel. Oh, yes, of course. I'll help you carry him out. So will I. No, no. I can manage alone, thank you. You have tea to enjoy. We wouldn't want Iris's brew to stew. Because there's no better way to make the professor comfortable than dragging him upstairs like a trunk. I wonder. Perhaps that was deliberate. 
Maybe Mr. Sholmes is making himself scarce to give Iris the chance to talk more freely. We must use this opportunity to talk to Iris. Find out what's going on. Primony, how long does this go? Would you like to tell us about it, Iris? About your father? I'm sure I told you before, didn't I? That Daddy used to be Hurley's partner. Yes. And that notes all about all the cases they involved together. Jesus. All the cases they solved together are kept inside that metal chest. That's right. Hurley told me, you see. He said that Daddy's somewhere far away now, so we can't meet. That's one way of describing it. Then, when I secretly unlocked the chest and read through the papers inside, I started to build up a picture in my head of what Daddy must be like. Well, that's only natural. You're just like any other girl of your age. I read that Daddy was a professor of medical science, so I studied and took my degree too. Well, that's only natural, I suppose. In that respect, you're not quite like any other girl of your age, though. But there was one thing that I could never find out. Daddy's name. Uh, his name wasn't anywhere on any of the notes that he'd made about his work with Hurley. But then one day... That's what happened, is it? When you saw this autopsy report, you finally managed to work it out. Is that right? Yes. So it was the handwriting in the report that caught her eye. When I saw the writing on that report, I could hardly believe it. I know that handwriting, I thought to myself. Because it was the same as the writing you'd seen on your father's case notes. Exactly. I was desperate to compare the two properly. I needed to see them side by side. I asked the doctor in the laboratory, but I was told I couldn't take the report away. And even worse, I was told that was the first and last time we'd be allowed even to look at it there. So you decided to steal it. When I compared the autopsy report with the case notes I had here, there was no doubt. The handwriting was exactly the same. It was Daddy's. And the signature of the coroner at the bottom of the autopsy report read Dr. John H. Wilson. So that's how I finally found out. I learnt Daddy's name at last. I see. Ever since then, I've called myself Iris Wilson. And that's also when I had the brilliant idea of writing stories all about Daddy's exciting times with Hurley. I decided there and then that I'd write The Adventures of Herlock Sholmes. Oh, Iris, I had no idea the stories had quite such a deep personal significance for you. I can see why the autopsy report was so important to her now and why she was prepared to break the law to get her hands on it. I must apologize, Iris. This is really all my fault. Really? I made a promise, you see, that until the time was right, I'd keep the details about your father a secret. I know, I, I've been very naughty. I'll take the autopsy report back to Dr. Gorey and apologize, I promise. Yes, we'll go together, I think. Then let me look after it for you until we get there. Since autopsy report has been entered in the court record. Let's look at it real quick while she's fumbling. We, did we look at the passport? Uh, within one week, Dunkirk, France, police business permission for the applicant and one additional person to travel. Okay, well, we know about that. He was taking Gina. Let's see, autopsy reports. Clint Van Zeeks, British nationality. Time of death, May 31st, between 9 and midnight. Death from a single stab wound to the heart. Other superficial external wounds indicative of a duel. 
Recent scarlet ink stains visible on the little and ring fingers of the right hand, but no document in corresponding ink was found. That's curious. Vital evidence recovered from the victim's stomach during autopsy. Credit to Inspector Gregson for petitioning so doggedly for the autopsy procedure. No internal trauma noted anywhere in the body. We're going to have to know that stuff, I guarantee. Stab wound. So he wasn't the one that got shot. Stab wound. Surely... John H. Wilson wasn't the body from the last episode with the stab wound. What the hell is going on in this story? I must go and water my herbs, I think. I'll see you all later. Sure. Poor Iris. She must be feeling awful. I know Mr. Sholmes is here for her, but still. Ah. What? How? What's the meaning of this, Mr. Sholmes? Mr. Sholmes? Oh dear me. So, you've noticed, I see. But that... that would mean... What on earth's the matter, Mr. Sato? You've turned as white as a sheet. Again, I think that's just the British weather. It's this autopsy report, Mr. Narahodo. The one from ten years ago. The writing... isn't Dr. Wilson's at all. Huh? What do you mean? How could you possibly know that? Let's look at this. Do we still have any access to... to a signature? I mean... Not really. All the... Yeah, we don't have any access to compare that. Because if we look at that, it could be similar to the other signature, but we don't have it now, so we can't look at it. Because I know this writing very well. This writing is my father's. What? Nani? Professor Mikorova's. Indeed, it's true. And now you know, my dear fellows. No, I don't know anything. What on earth does all of this mean, Mr. Sholmes? Because the idea that's slowly forming in my mind is just too extraordinary to believe. Please, you have to explain. So, this autopsy report was actually penned by Professor Mikotoba, then? But that makes no sense. It's not possible, surely. Possible, my dear fellow, pray take a deep breath and think again. Yes, you're right. In some ways, it actually makes a great deal of sense. It, it does? Ten years ago is when my father returned to Japan after his extended study tour in Britain. And prior to his return, where was Dr. Mikotoba engaged? Ah, uh, yes, of course. He was an assistant in Dr. Wilson's laboratory, learning about forensic science. And as an assistant, he would have aided with the dissection work, making detailed notes, which would be assembled into the full autopsy report. Once the work was complete, the head coroner would check the contents and put his signature on the document. In other words, the only writing of Dr. Wilson's in the report would be his signature at the end. I see. So Iris got the wrong end of the stick, you mean? She saw that and assumed the whole report had been written by Dr. John H. Wilson. Which is very understandable, of course. What a complicated situation.
thinking about it, most of what we know about you, Mr. Sholmes, comes from the published stories of your exploits. Yes, the adventures of Herlock Sholmes, written by Iris. And we really have no way of knowing what's fact and what's fiction. Most troubling for you, my dear fellow, I'm sure. So, what about this supposed partner of yours? Did he really exist or not? Oh, you've come straight to the point, I see. And please come straight to the answer. I believe Iris explained it in one of his installments. He was a trusted comrade, and the only person I could truly have called a friend. And did this partner of yours truly make a record of all your cases? Are his notes really stored inside that metal chest? Absolutely, my dear madam. Absolutely. So where's your partner now? We rarely meet. See, he lives on the other side of the world. But if this autopsy report and the records of all your old cases were penned by the same hand, and if the autopsy report was written, though not signed by your famous partner, there would be only one logical conclusion. Pray, impress me. Your partner would have to be Eugene Mikotoba. In other words, Mrs. Sato's father. On my word, Mr. Naruhado. Uh, yes? You are coming along wonderfully. You have hit upon the method at last. You finally grasp the art of deduction. You mean to say, allow me to introduce you. To my great friend and partner, Mikotoba. Professor Mikotoba? Oh my god, we're still not done. Th does this mean that you're the real Dr. Wilson? No, 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 my dear, I'm still my old self, Eugene Mikotoba, your father. Oh, uh, of course. This is obviously too much for Sasato-san to take in. I must say, though, how my old friend has attained worldwide celebrity as a great mystery solver is the greatest mystery of all. I still remember the first time we met. Ah, uh, pray remind me, when was it again, Mikotoba? Sixteen years ago, Sholmes. Ah, yes, quite. Sixteen years ago. I'd just arrived from Japan with she Seishiro and Genshin. I was in search of lodgings close to the hospital, some comfortable rooms for a reasonable price. But rents are devilishly high in that particular area. That's right, so I decided I needed someone to share lodgings and the expense and was fortunate enough to be introduced to Sholmes, who found himself in a similar situation. I was a callow fellow back then, a mere shadow of the great detective you see before you now. I was working at the hospital's chemical laboratory, at the time indulging my curiosities for a little gain. And the situation of our cohabitation led us to pursuing cases together, you see. Hard to believe it was a mere six years. We had a great many adventures. But in the last year of Mikotoba's stay in Britain, that most infamous of cases presented itself. The case with which you've become rather familiar yourselves. The Professor Killings. After the trial, Seishiro and I were summoned back home. Hardly surprising. Given the circumstances, God, can we, can we not have a third person talk and interject? So there you have it. And as you know... All the details recorded by my trusty chronicler remain in that metal chest. This is just amazing. Professor Mikotoba really is Mr. Sholmes' famous partner? Father. Goodness, uh, my dear, what a cutting look. As your daughter, I'm very proud to learn that you are the great detective's great partner. But nevertheless... There's another mystery that I really must ask you to explain now. A and that is... 
You know very well what it is. The unresolved matter of Iris's father. Uh, of course, I'd almost forgotten about that one. Seeing how you can't remember what people tell you five minutes prior. I'm not surprised. I should have seen this coming, I suppose. Iris told us that all the notes about the great detective's adventures that are in that metal chest were written by her father. Isn't that correct, Mr. Sholmes? That is indeed what I told young Iris. But if you're Mr. Sholmes's partner, father, and you wrote all those case notes, then Iris's father must be you. Upon my word, Mr. Sato. You are coming along wonderfully as well. Yet you too have hit upon the method at last. You finally grasped the art of deduction. Oh, what? Uh. What you've always told me, Father, is that my mother died when I was born 16 years ago, and you left me in Grandmother's care whilst you embarked on your study tour of Britain. And I've always accepted that. But all this about Iris... Oh, there it is. Sato san's ice-cold stare. Uh, no, now hold on a minute. It was very complicated. I mean, it's not really what you think. Then perhaps you'd like to explain exactly what it is? There it is. Now the eyes go from ice cold to red hot, just before she... Uh, no, really, you, you've got the wrong end of the stick. Uh, Sholm, say something, man. That's quite enough, my fiery fellows. Mr. Sholmes? When did he get all dressed up? Whilst I don't like to interrupt this exciting exploration of the past, Mikoto and I have an urgent matter that requires a short excursion. But it's very late, Mr. Sholmes. There must... Where must you go? Why, my dear madam, is that not obvious? My partner and I must pursue our natural enemies. So, get your coat, Mikoto. The game is afoot. Um, but Schultz, I really must give Susato a full explanation, I think. Later, my dear fellow, later. Our carriage awaits downstairs already. You haven't changed one iota, have you? I mean, really. I visit our home after ten long years, and when I open that chest in a fit of nostalgia, I quite inexplicably pass out. And as if that wasn't enough, when I eventually regain consciousness, I'm plunged straight into all of this. Father, please. Go with Mr. Sholmes now. What? I've no doubt that whatever happened, you were acting in everyone's best interests. I trust you completely. Susato. And sending the great detective and his great partner off on renewed adventures together is more than I could have hoped for in my wildest dreams. Very well, then. We'll speak again later. So, I believe your own work is done for the day. I wish you the best of luck for tomorrow. Yes, Naruto. Good luck in battle, and in reaching a decision. A decision? About whether to go back to Japan, I suppose? So much happened that day that I barely knew what to do with myself. It would only be later that I'd come to realize how amidst the chaos I'd unleashed were all the clues I needed to finally unearth the truth and that all the turmoil was necessary to give me the resolve to see everything through. Again, I'm not really sure why sentence by sentence we had to say okay and it could have just automatically done the thing. And... What do you mean, end? Is this a split chapter thing? It is. Okay. Well, maybe the game will actually be shorter than I thought. I'll see you next time.